Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on Sustainable Urban Infrastructure Opportunities in India, organized by Enterprise Singapore. My name is Manu, and I am part of Enterprise Singapore's South Asia team, and I'll be your MC for today. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I see that we have already a number of participants who have joined us, which is excellent. And I hope that each and every one of you will find the session useful and will be able to learn and explore sustainable urban infrastructure opportunities in India. I would now like to invite Ms. Audrey Tan, Global Markets Director, South Asia, Enterprise Singapore, and Director, Economic Development of Singapore India Partnership Office to give us the welcome address. Ms. Tan, please. Thank you, Manu. Namaste and good morning and good afternoon to our distinguished industry leaders and participants. In 2015, India committed to achieving the, the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and 169 associated targets by 2030. This commitment was then reinforced through the creation of Niti Ayok in the same year to oversee the implementation throughout the country. Since then, India has taken important steps towards the achievement of these goals. Example, the Jao Jivan mission, which is really the government of India's ambition to bring water to every household, setting net zero carbon neutral targets and e-vehicles adoptions by government offices to name just but a few. In all this effort and given the magnitude of what's required, the partnership between public, private and even rural communities is particularly important towards the sustainability push. Singapore, like India, prioritizes sustainability. Being an island nation that is land scarce, we have always had to balance pursuing economic growth and with minimizing environmental impact. To that end, Singapore issued our first formal Singapore Green Plan in 1992, which I also found out in preparation for this remarks. It is essentially a 10-year blueprint for our environmental sustainability. Since then, and at regular intervals, we have refreshed and re uh, the plans to address new concerns such as transboundary air pollution and climate change caused by greenhouse gas emissions. Our latest is the SGP 2030 to guide us for the next decade. The SGPs are also a tripartite effort between our public sector, private and our people, the communities. Supportive and enabling public sector policies help the private sector to develop in a more sustainable manner and allow many of our Singapore companies to develop capabilities, technologies, and solutions to solve sustainability issues across various industries. Today, these capabilities and technologies are deployed across Singapore, blending seamlessly into our environment and daily lives. So as businesses start to incorporate sustainability as the foundation for their growth and responsible development. I'm very glad to have with us leading practitioners in the infrastructure space to share their insights, priorities, and key initiatives thus far. So a very warm welcome to Mr. Ko Juan Tiang of Infrastructure Asia, Mr. Vaisak Kapadia of ALMT Legal, Mr. Vinamra Srivastav of Capital Land, Mr. Samir Sanke of Tata Projects, Mr. Anup Matthew of Gorech Construction and Mr. Prakut Mehta of ESR India. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And I wish everyone a most productive and insightful session ahead. Thank you, Ms. Tan. I'm now pleased to invite our first speaker, Mr. Kao Chun Tiang, Deputy Executive Director, Infrastructure Asia. Prior to this appointment at Infrastructure Asia, Mr. Kao was the Coordinating Group Director for the Environment and Infrastructure Solutions Group of International Enterprise Singapore, which is now presently known as Enterprise Singapore. He was responsible for assisting Singapore-based companies from the environment and infrastructure solutions industries with their ventures into strategic high-growth markets such as China, India, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Today, Mr. Kao will be sharing with us about the importance of sustainable infrastructure and Singapore-India collaboration. Mr. Kao, please. Hi, thanks, Manu. Thanks for the very extensive introduction of myself and uh, thanks, Audrey, for inviting me. So a very good afternoon to those in Singapore and good morning to those who are joining us from India. I'm Juan Tiang from Infrastructure Asia, 
I am delighted to join this webinar on sustainable urban infrastructure opportunities in India, organized by Enterprise Singapore. Sustainability is a top priority for countries across the globe. Governments and business leaders worldwide are working hard to address them by announcing their commitments to the environmental, social and governance principle, as well as their plans to achieve net zero emissions. Next slide, please. Asia is no exception. There's a lot of work to be done in sustainable infrastructure in the region. But this also means that there are many opportunities for businesses to contribute towards this process. For example, according to the United Nations, 2021 is a make or break year in the fight against climate change. To limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we must cut global emissions by 45% by 2030 from 2010 levels. The current pandemic has also accelerated this shift towards sustainability. Infrastructure Asia has been discussing with quite a lot of our supply side partner, and we do see this acceleration towards sustainability very clearly. We see a confluence of political, technological, and financial factors coming together to drive this shift. Politically, the transition towards a more sustainable and net zero carbon economy has already begun. Countries have started setting their targets. The European Union, Japan, and South Korea, for example, aim to be climate neutral by 2050, while I think China has pledged to reach that goal by 2060. India is also well on track to meet its Paris Agreement target, with the country doubling down on clean energy sources. In the last decade, technology has helped us better measure the impact of sustainability on society and the economy. It also helps improve the efficiency and traceability of system. For example, there has been increased adoption of technology solutions for better global supply chain traceability, particularly solutions that can trace the origin of raw material and ensure that they adhere to the highest standards of sustainability practices. Financially, we also see a strong drive towards sustainable investing. For example, BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager has urged companies to publicly disclose their plans for how they will operate in a world with net zero emissions by 2050. With the focus on sustainability by governments and corporates, the availability of funding for sustainability link project has increased. This viable pool of funding serves to motivate developers to integrate sustainable features into each of their projects. Furthermore, we are beginning to see sustainability linked projects generating a higher premium or rate of return compared to conventional projects. This is a virtual cycle that we are seeing, and I think that would assist to further increase the pool of funding available. The infrastructure opportunities in India are also abundant. I think IFC estimate that a total climate smart investment opportunity of $3.1 trillion in India from 2018 to 2030 across various sectors, including renewable energy, transport infrastructure, green building, municipal solid waste management, climate smart urban water, and climate smart agriculture. To successfully implement this infrastructure, expertise and know-how across different disciplines is required. Next slide, please. There are many areas Singapore can contribute to the development of sustainability including green buildings, transit-oriented development, renewable water and waste management. In any large city, buildings are a major consumer of electricity. This is even more pronounced in an ultra-urbanized city like Singapore. Therefore, our buildings are an important part of Singapore's climate change mitigation strategy, as I think it accounts for 20% of emission in Singapore. Singapore's Inter-Ministerial Committee on Sustainable Development targets to have at least 80% of the building gross floor area in Singapore to be green by 2030 through the Green Building Master Plan. As of March 2020, Singapore has greened more than 40% of the built environment. I think that's equivalent to about 12 million square meters of space. That is, and that causes a large ecosystem of firms, of, of firms in Singapore with the requisite capabilities and capacities in green building that can contribute to India's growth in this particular area. 
Building also represents a huge asset class that can enjoy the benefits of green financing. Singapore is Asia's leading financial hub for sustainable bond issuance. And funds raised from such issuance will be able to drive more implementation of sustainable buildings in the region. Next slide, please. Singapore has a long history of implementing integrated urban designs, incorporating work, live, play elements in our satellite town, as well as commercial centers. Most of our major transport nodes and interchanges features integration of transport hubs, integrated with retail and commercial space, alongside shelter paths that will contribute to, which will connect to residences. Such an integrated approach to land use improves the economic performance and urban livability of cities as they grow. Well-planned, land-based, transit-orientated development increases the volume of people that uses the particular transport node. This, increase, this increases the viability of that transit-orientated development. This is another area that I can see more Singapore-India collaboration. Next slide, please. Climate adaptation. Our climate change is an existential threat to Singapore. Our government has set aside $100 billion for climate mitigation and adaptation measure. This has led to Singapore's infrastructure being built with climate adaptation and mitigation features to ensure long-term sustainability. For example, Singapore's MRT station were built with elevated entrances for flood protection. These will be important issues that government all over the world including Singapore and India, will be grappling with in the implementation of their respective infrastructure. Next slide, please. Singapore is also the hub for innovation, water innovation and is also the headquarter to many top water innovation companies in the world. Singapore has gone through digitalization for our own water journey. We can play a role, for example, in knowledge transfer and creating awareness of digitalization digitalizing the existing water infrastructure to tackle the challenges of the future. Waste management is another important area. Efficient waste management is crucial for a city to grow sustainably, given how ineffective waste management leads to unsanitary and unhealthy living environments. Singapore Integrated Waste Management Facility, the IWMF, seeks to treat Singapore's solid waste through the utilization of sustainable waste to energy technology showcasing an alternative to landfill. Next slide, please. Globally, we are seeing in transition in, a, tr a transition in energy generation to power our economy. One of the key sources of, of that, of course, is renewable energy. Renewables are fast gaining traction as they are cheaper and faster to implement vis-a-vis -vis conventional power generation. Adopting good technology is key to more successful implementation, bringing with them the promise of injecting productivity, resilience, cost efficiency, and innovation. For example, Siemens Sun's tracking system can raise the yield of PV power plants by 30 to 40%. Singapore houses many clean technology solutions provider. Because of our unique situation, where the land is scarce, we have developed and implemented many solutions using solar on rooftops and water bodies including in our reservoirs. In integration of battery storage in some of these projects are also becoming critical. Infrastructure Asia organized a virtual showcase last year to share with our regional counterparties some of these offerings. Next slide, please. To support the region's infrastructure development, Infrastructure Asia was set up in 2018 as a project facilitation office. The objective of the office is to create and enable more infrastructure opportunities in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Next slide, please. Infrastructure Asia do this by curating and connecting firms with various products and services to form a solution to meet the needs of the regional government. In order to further enable our objective, Infrastructure Asia will provide structuring advice and capacity building to the regional government to enhance their ability to deliver these projects. Next slide, please. The office acts as a platform to bring together capabilities and capacities from the Singapore public and private sector to form a solution. 
Singapore ecosystem has the full range of offerings to plan, design, develop, finance, construct, and operate sustainable infrastructure. At the same time, the office worked closely with multilaterals like the World Bank Group, the Asian Development Bank, and other DFIs, for example, the NIDA from Denmark, and globally, to complete the solution. Next slide, please. Since Infrastructures Asia's establishment, the office has focused in five countries in Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, Cambodia, and Myanmar, and two countries in South Asia, namely India and Bangladesh. More recently, we have also been engaging in Best India, which is oversees the national infrastructure pipeline. And we hope to connect with more players in India to support the sustainable infrastructure developmental goals. I'm glad to see some of the Singapore-based companies amongst the speaker today. And I look forward to your presentation on the initiatives and opportunities too. With that, let me pass the bike back to Mano. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kao. I'm sure many of our participants, myself included, have gleaned insights from your sharing. So thanks again. Our next speaker is Mr. Veshak Kapadia, partner at ALMT Legal. Mr. Kapadia has more than 17 years of experience in advising Indian and international clients on corporate matters. His speciality is in private equity investments, joint ventures, mergers and acquisitions. Mr. Kapadia also advises on exchange control regulations, outbound investments from India, foreign investments in India, incorporation of entities in India, real estate matters and compliance issues. Given his areas of expertise, Mr. Kapadia will be giving us an overview of the infrastructure landscape in India, government FDIs, and about entering the Indian market. Mr. Kapadia, please. Thank you, Manu, for the kind introduction. And uh, good morning and good afternoon. Next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I have passed uh, my law from uh, Mumbai, India, and I'm a solicitor of England and Wales as well. Next slide, please. Next slide. Hello. Yes, so uh, to tell you a little bit uh, about uh, some key highlights from the budget 2021, uh, the national infrastructure pipeline is intended to be expanded to 7,400 infrastructure projects in India. Uh, this pipeline, uh, sorry, the previous slide. Previous slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so it essentially consists, of, uh, it is funded by the central government, uh, by the state government, and by the private sector, and they essentially intend to invest in the social and commercial infrastructure. Uh, some of the key highlights are uh, from the budget are the creation of an institutional structure, which is the development financial institution, which will act as a provider, enable and catalyst in infrastructure financing. Uh, there is a, a big thrust intended for the monetizing of assets, which would uh, essentially include uh, airport and railway infrastructure to be monetized, uh, operational toll roads and transmission of assets uh, to a infrastructure investment trust. And uh, in addition to this, uh, there would be an enhancing of uh, uh, enhancing of the share of capital expenditure. Next slide, please. Next. Yeah. Uh, uh, in addition to this, from a foreign investment perspective uh, in the infrastructure sector, uh, the government has essentially relaxed some of the conditions pertaining to prohibition of private funding and restriction on commercial activities and direct investment in the infrastructure sector in order to make sure that large number of funds invest in India. Uh, uh, further, additionally, you know, they have notified infrastructure debt funds, which will be eligible to raise funds by issuing a tax efficient zero coupon bond. Uh, let's in, in case of getting sector specific for infrastructure from the road and highways perspective, the, this budget brings the highest ever outlay 
uh, for the Ministry of Road Transport, around 13,000 kilometers of roads would be awarded for construction and another 8,500 by March 2022. Uh, economic corridors are being planned in certain states and flagship corridors and expressways are intended to be awarded as well. Further, there, there is an intention to, uh, to introduce advanced traffic management system in all new four and six lane highways. Next. Next. In terms of railway infrastructure, there is a national plan with, uh, for India with an intention to create a future ready railway system by broad gauge routes to be completed by December 2023. And further, uh, there are plans to make sure that there are Western dedicated freight corridors and Eastern dedicated freight corridors, which would be commissioned by June 2022. In addition to this, there are measures which are planned to be taken for uh, the convenience and the safety of passengers, such as aesthetically designed Vista Dome coaches for tourist routes for better travel. Next slide. Next. Infrastructure. Uh, the, this budget intends to raise a share of the public and augmentation of the city bus service. Uh, further, there is an intention to bring about a public private partnership uh, to run more than 20,000 buses. Uh, and uh, in order to boost the automobile sector, further employment opportunities are also intended to be created for the youth. There is a central counterpart funding. Central funding, which is in, intended for Kochi Metro Railways and other Metro Railways as well. Next. Uh, in terms of power infrastructure, 139 gigawatts of installed capacity and 1.41 lakh circuit kilometers of transmission lines are to be added. Uh, consumers will have alternatives to choose the distribution company for enhancing competitiveness. And further, a comprehensive national hydro National Hydro Emission 2021-22 is also intended to be launched. Next. A certain key investments in the infrastructure space in 2019 were witnessed. Uh, the M&A deals touched uh, US dollars 1,461 million. Uh, pre -B and VC investments touched an all-time high of $14.5 billion in 2019. Uh, the largest deal was done by Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, uh, the Public Sector Pension Fund, and the National Investment and Infrastructure Fund, as they made an investment of $1.1 billion in GVK Airport Holdings. Uh, in terms of uh, sector-specific construction development and infrastructure activities, received an, for an investment of USD $25.78 billion and $17.22 billion, respectively. Next, please. Uh, in terms of foreign investments, in 2020-21, India has got an FDI of 8.3 billion from Singapore, uh, which just goes to show that the government's efforts to, uh, to improve the ease of doing business in India has paid off rich dividends. In terms of upcoming opportunities, the infrastructure sector has become the biggest focus of the Indian government. India plans to spend 1.4 trillion on infrastructure from the period for the period 2019 to 23. And the government has also suggested an investment of $750 billion for railway infrastructure from 2018 to 2030. Uh, in terms of sustainable and responsible infrastructure development, India is not only an, uh, intending and planning an infrastructure development, but also trying to ensure uh, sustainability and developing responsibility. Uh, responsibly. Uh, the infrastructure connectivity vertical, as mentioned earlier, Niti IO, it has been mandated to provide an integrated and holistic approach to the transport sector by promoting and facilitate, facilitating efficient, sustainable, environment friendly, and balanced multimodal transport system. This vertical is actively contributing towards the development of a roadmap of India's mobility. Uh, in case, uh, in case of investment, foreign investment into India, 
in, if you wish to set up a wholly on subsidiary or a joint venture, there are some, certain sectoral caps, and these are also subject to certain permissions, which may or may not be required. Uh, so when we say automatic route, entry route, automatic route, it means that no permission is required from the Reserve Bank of India, or alternatively, even the government of India. So some of these sectors which are relevant from an infrastructure perspective, we have, we, we have listed it out here, uh, which is airport infrastructure, that is be it greenfield project or, hundred, or existing you know, brownfield projects. 100% foreign investment is permitted under the automatic route. In terms of airport transport, uh, transport services, uh, unless it is a scheduled airport uh, air transport service or a regional air transport service, 100% investment is permitted because in these cases, only in these cases, uh, would 49% uh, be under the automatic route and beyond 49%, it would be under the government route. Next slide, please. Uh, telecom services, again, as mentioned earlier, up to 49% uh, for telecom infrastructure, it is permitted under the automatic route and beyond 49%, uh, government uh, of India would be required to grant permission in order to make investments. Next slide, please. For railway infrastructure, once again, 100% foreign direct investment is permitted in India under the automatic route and no permission would be required for this. Next, please. For an industrial park and in terms of construction development, that is townships, housing, uh, built up infrastructure, that would be under the 100% investment uh, under the automatic route as well. Next slide, please. Uh, in case you do not wish to set up uh, a wholly owned subsidiary or have a joint venture as, as a corporate entity, the other alternatives are to set up a liaison office in India. Uh, this liaison office would merely be a channel of communication between the head office back home and the entities in India. Uh, one needs to note that it cannot undertake any kind of commercial activity and it is merely required to maintain itself from inward remittances received from abroad. Uh, certain specific permissible activities uh, for a liaison office are representing the parent company in India, promoting import and export to and from India, promoting technical and financial collaboration between the parent company and companies in India, and merely acting as a communication channel between the parent company and the Indian company. Next slide, please. In terms of eligibility criteria, uh, the applicant entity from Singapore would require profit-making track record for the preceding three financial years, and it should have a net worth of at least, at least 50,000 USD or its equivalent. In the event that the applicant entity cannot meet this criteria, a letter of comfort can be given by its parent company, subject to the condition that the parent company satisfied the prescribed criteria. Next slide, please. Uh, in case you want to do a little more than have a liaison office, the other alternative would be to set up a branch office. Uh, this is only permitted to foreign companies which are in uh, the manufacturing and the trading sector. Uh, this has a few more activities which can be carried out by the branch office, which is export and import of goods, rendering professional or consultancy services, carrying out research work in which the parent company is engaged, promoting technical and financial collaboration, uh, representing the parent company in India for buying and selling as a, a buying and selling agent, uh, rendering services in the IT and IT sector and development of software in India, providing technical support for products supplied by the parent company, and representing a foreign airline or a shipping company in India. The eligibility criteria here is a little higher that requires a profit making track record for the past five financial years and a net worth of a US of USD 100,000. And further, in, the, in case the, person, the applicant company is not financially sound and cannot meet the eligibility criteria, the parent company can give a letter of comfort in order to meet the criteria during the application. Uh, the one more alternative would be to set up a project office. This is generally used by foreign entities when it's the project specific mandate that they have obtained from an Indian entity. Uh, it, this project office is merely uh, to uh, represent the interest of the foreign company executing the project in India, and it excludes a liaison office. So one should not get, uh, make sure that there is no overlap in terms of activities. 
the criteria and the requirements here are that the project should be funded directly by inward remittance from abroad. Uh, the project should have been cleared by the appropriate authority. It should be funded by a bilateral or multilateral international financing agency. And lastly, the company in India awarding the contract should have uh, has granted a, has been granted a term loan by a public financial institution or by a bank in India for the project. Uh, in terms of uh, setting up uh, MSME, which is a micro, small, or medium-sized enterprise in India, uh, some of the eligibility criteria are listed here. That is, entities with an investment of INR 10 million or a turnover of 50 million. Uh, small units would be enterprises with investment of 100 million or a turnover up, of up to 500 million. And medium-sized uh, enterprises would be enterprises with up to uh, INR 200 million or a turnover of 1 billion INR. The registration has requir is required to be done by the entity uh, which has a place of business in India by making an application on the online portal. Next, please. Some of our practice areas, uh, most importantly, mergers and acquisitions, private equity, and setting up uh, entities in India and Foreign Exchange Management Act advice. Next, please. Some of our accolades from Chambers and Partners, Asia Law Services, Legal 500, India Business Law Journal, and ILFR. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kapadia, for sharing with the audience about the infrastructure landscape, the various FDI policies, as well as the different entry routes to India. For the next segment, we have with us Mr. Vinamra Srivastav, CEO of Business Parks Capital Land India. Mr. Srivastav oversees investments, development, operations, asset management, and strategic planning for capital land groups business parks in India, and leads the expansion and enhancement of the group's portfolio of assets in the country. Previously based in Singapore, Mr. Srivastav headed the group corporate strategy and development, and he was also the contributor to the successful Ascendus Singbridge post-merger integration process. Today, Mr. Srivastav will be sharing with us about the outlook for business parks, as well as Capital Land India's sustainability initiatives and plans. Mr. Srivastav, please. Hi, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much to the ESG team for giving me this opportunity to share thoughts uh, about uh, what's happening in the business parks uh, and IT office landscape in India. And how does that tie up to everything that not only capital land, but some of the leading players in the country are doing as far as sustainability? Uh, next slide, please. Hi, next slide, please. So very quick snapshot on what's happening with the office sector. This is a topic that is hotly debated in light of uh, what's happening with COVID uh, in terms of future office and work from home and the impact, et cetera. If we look at the numbers, uh, 2019 was a record year for Indian office market in terms of the absorption or, or, or demand, where we clogged more than 60 million square feet of space that was absorbed. Uh, as expected, 2020, because of COVID, that number dropped to almost half. Uh, but if we compare uh, the 2020 absorption number to what was happening in the previous three years uh, of COVID, uh, then the picture is slightly different because 2019 was an exceptional year. Uh, so it is expected that uh, probably by middle of 2022 uh, or maybe second half of 2022, uh, the, the consultants in the market do predict the office market to come back in terms of demand to somewhere close to where the pre-COVID numbers were, uh, uh, which is the average of, let's say, 2016 to 2018. Uh, but the interesting shift that's, that's been happening is also how technology uh, as an occupier industry in Indian real estate has been uh, uh, taking great traction. And that's not surprising. Uh, one of the key impact of COVID has been the acceleration of digitalization globally across many industries which earlier were probably a bit more lethargic in digitalizing themselves. And naturally, a lot of that work is continuing to come to India 
because of the inherent advantages of uh, one of highly skilled and english speaking digital talent and secondly uh, the sheer cost advantages both of real estate as well as operations so we do see that uh, the office market in india will continue to thrive bigger because of these fundamental advantages that it enjoys uh, as long as uh, uh, the global digitalization wave continues and there is there's no reason to doubt that 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 is not going to be the case uh, next slide please so what does it mean in terms of a post covid scenario of how the office ecosystem is going to pan out uh, uh this is a snapshot of uh, of what one of the leading uh, consulting players in the market uh, uh, highlights but it is also quite consistent with what we have been hearing from a lot of our customers uh, who are some of the largest fortune 500 uh, uh, occupiers uh, globally from different industries and there are two three themes that come out very naturally right the first is uh, probably gone are the days where you just want to have one single office building in one part of town and expect everybody to come there so increasingly in the future the expectation is that the workspace will get distributed now we must keep in mind that a distributed workspace in an emerging market like india uh, or for for that matter south america or even certain parts of southeast asia uh, is envisaged a bit differently from what it would mean for a singapore or a london or a hong kong or a new york in the sense that the emerging markets still do not have that much robust infrastructure to be able to sustain a presence of uh, satellite offices in different parts uh, of the same city uh, uh, just like let's say what a singapore can do and and the transit oriented development that was already highlighted was a perfect example on, on why that can work very well in singapore but probably to a limited success in india but what it would definitely mean for a country like india is that the flexibility of where people are working and it could be from a flex office uh, or home or uh, on demand meeting center so on and so forth will continue to increase so the likely scenario is is more hybrid uh, and neither uh, at the two extremes uh, because there are inherent challenges uh, in a country like india on on permanently working from uh, from home and and uh, and that will provide the opportunities for for a midway where there are there's just more flexibility provided to the people clearly uh, covid has brought to forth uh, for the right reasons the importance of wellness uh, and 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 health in the way people view uh, their office premises uh, uh, with uh, correspondingly there is also a tremendous increase in the adoption of proptech uh, and i'll cover a little bit of that slightly later on for for example what capital land is doing in india on the adoption of proptech uh, you know real estate traditionally Uh, has not been at the forefront of an industry that you would associate it uh, with fast digitalization uh, uh, e- even sustainability for that matter but i think over the last 3 to 4 years especially in countries like india that is changing very rapidly and a lot of that is also driven by the amount of foreign capital that is pouring into india because when foreign capital comes in a country like india it brings with itself a lot of responsibility a lot of expectations uh, both on esg as well as digitalization and proptech and it no longer becomes a matter of of choice but it becomes a matter of survival and customer expectation as well and collectively that's a very healthy direction in which the industry has moved over the over the past few years next slide please so in that light if we look at what capital land is doing in india if you could just go to the next slide Uh, uh we have been present in the country for more than 25 years uh, today capland uh, operates uh, and owns more than 19 million square feet uh we have deployed uh, more than 3 billion dollars uh, of aum in india and and we are uh, present pretty much across all the six uh, top tier micro markets uh, in india uh, as far as the office uh, space is concerned next slide uh, a very quick snapshot of what's coming up in terms of our development means i think the key message here is one uh, uh this 19 million square feet is almost going to grow double in size over the next 5 years uh, and this is this is just a snapshot of some of the existing uh, parks that are under construction uh, in various stages of development in various cities uh, in the country 
Next slide, please. Having dependent on office space uh, for this long, if you could just go to the next slide, uh, what Capital Land is doing in India now is shifting its focus from just being a player depending on and riding on the growth of office space, but also very quickly diversifying itself into the new economic sectors of logistics, co-working, and data center. Uh, we have, over the last two to three years, established significant platforms across these three verticals. Logistics is a much more advanced stage than the other two. But the future for us is very clear, which is in the next five years, our presence in India will be, uh, will be fairly well balanced and these three new asset classes uh, as well. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the new normal that the customers are expecting from their work premises and from the IT parks, uh, it is pretty much built on three pillars, and that's how we sort of uh, prioritize it uh, to our customers as well. The first is ensuring that uh, from uh, a cleanliness perspective, uh, there is absolutely deep cleaning and sanitizing of, uh, of all the touch points in the park. Uh, the journey of anybody entering large-scale IT parks uh, is becoming absolutely contactless, whether it is for the employees of the parks or for visitors. And a lot of that is being enabled by the technology and digital solution uh, that we are putting in. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a glimpse of what Capital Land is doing in terms of, of uh, focusing on prop tech, but it is also representative of what's happening with the larger players in the ecosystem. So for example, Increasingly, all our parks and buildings are sitting uh, on a cloud-based IoT platform uh, where, uh, based on AI and predictive analysis, the buildings can really talk to each other. And what that does is that results in, in increased efficiency of our uh, 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 energy guzzling equipment, so resulting in significant uh, environmental saving and operational efficiencies. Uh, a lot of focus on health and wellness, right, from ensuring that the uh, that the AHUs, for example, in the air conditioning are UVGI enabled, there is antimicrobial coating everywhere, uh, so on and so forth. And also moving to the point of being contactless uh, through focusing on every service of the park being readily available uh, on a mobile platform through an app. Uh, so nobody really needs to have any touch points in the park at all. So whether it is customer experience, operational efficiency or sustainability, the use of technology uh, is becoming increasingly uh, inherent uh, uh, as part of a strategy of growing in India. Uh, next slide, please. Along with that, what has happened is that our sustainability efforts have been built in a very methodical and scientific way over the last many years. And, and Capital Land's focus on ESG and environmental sustainability uh, on one end is driven significantly by what's happening at the group level in Singapore. Uh, uh, and then it is cascaded down uh, in great detail to each of the countries, and India is one of the leaders in the capital and group on that. And we approach sustainability through key pillars, uh, and those key pillars include focus on uh, uh, renewable energy and reduction of energy consumption, focus on increasing efficiency of our buildings, given uh, how buildings and real estate is one of the biggest guzzlers. Uh, of energy and thereby emitter of, uh, of carbon. Uh, increased focus on e-mobility and connectivity, uh, uh, looking at uh, sustainability from the point of view of design of our buildings and products and not just operations. And ultimately, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of focus on health and well-being as well. And I'll give a few examples on what we've achieved in India and what is the roadmap for us going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So, if, if I break down the initiatives uh, uh, in each of these pillars, we've made significant progress and a lot of our future efforts are going into these directions. For example, let's take renewable power. Today, uh, we source almost more than 40% of our energy needs in the entire country through solar power. And this is not just the rooftop panels. I mean, the rooftop panels honestly are great, but they do very little uh, in terms of the amount of consumption it can help. Right, so we have done power purchase agreements with solar farms, uh, and 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 through those PPAs, uh, it helps in us uh, uh, relying on solar power to run our parks. Uh, beyond that, we are also in the process of evaluating investing ourselves 
uh, as uh, an equity holder in a solar power farm in South India, which will make us not only a user of solar power, but also a generator of solar power. Uh, and that will take us our, our percentage to more than 50% in the entire country. Uh, through all the operational efficiency measures that we have put in, uh, for example, uh, what I mentioned in terms of using technology, we have reduced our water and energy consumption on a per square feet by more than 40% over the last many years. Uh, our buildings, uh, all our new buildings are of course going to be uh, gold or platinum certified, but even the older buildings uh, right now are 80% in the next couple of years, they will all be 100% green certified as well. We are moving towards making our parks zero waste. So all the solid waste, for example, we consume has to be uh, uh, generate has to be consumed within the parks as well. So a lot of practical measures uh, and targets uh, uh, on which we measure ourselves. The future is moving to measure all of these in construction. Uh, we've been doing it in operations and now we're going to focus on construction. Right now, you would be surprised, a lot of contractors in India don't even measure their construction waste and construction energy and water consumption. We are making it mandatory. If there's any contractor who has to work with Capital Land, he has to show us their ability to measure all these parameters before even they can bid for our projects, because that's the kind of targets we are setting for, for ourselves. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll skip this. This is just an example of what we have done on renewables. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide to just highlight uh, what's for, for the future of sustainability in real estate in India. And then there are four key things that need to happen. The first is the pace of innovation and technology has to accelerate. Right now, a lot of leading players are taking the front step in, in investments into tech, but I think the business cases have to be evolved so that even the mid-sized players can participate. Only when that happens, will we see a much larger scale adoption of these measures across the industry. The second key pillar is uh, a stronger collaboration between the developer and the occupiers. The great thing is that most of the Fortune 500 companies uh, or even the larger ones that occupy these buildings have themselves very strong ESG targets. So the interests uh, are absolutely aligned. What needs to happen is a stronger ecosystem that needs to develop where the developer can partner with the occupier and these companies to, to uh, lead a lot of these efforts uh, uh, together. The third is commercial viability and funding. And I think this is the most critical bit. We work with a lot of entrepreneurs and SMEs who want to showcase their solutions on prop tech and sustainability uh, to real estate and, and urban technology. And the key thing there is their requirement of being commercially viable. Because if they are not commercially viable, uh, there's, you know, in the long run, there's no free lunch. Uh, so it is very critical for us to not only pilot these solutions, but, but help them and handhold them to ensure that there is a path to profitability, which is the only way this can percolate sustainability. And lastly, help from the government on updating the regulations. And more so in terms of policies put into data center, for example, which are energy guzzlers and even renewable energy. There are still only some states in India where heavy investment in renewable makes sense and there are some where it is still a challenge. And I think if these four levers and pillars can really be strengthened, uh, I have no doubt with the advancement in technology and the huge demand of real estate space in India, there's no reason why India shouldn't be able to match steps in terms of its contribution to ESG uh, in the many years to come. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Srivastava, for giving us a better understanding on the outlook for business parks, as well as sharing about Capital Lens India's sustainability plans. Our next speaker is Mr. Samir Sankhe, who heads the Digital Transformation and Sustainability Solutions at Tata Projects Limited in Mumbai. At Tata Projects, he pioneered a sustainability management tech platform that helps manage water resources, energy, air, and people safety. Mr. Sankhe has wide international experience of consulting Fortune 100 CXOs on executing strategy. He's an entrepreneur at heart and has founded and ran several startups and entrepreneurial ventures. Today, Mr. Sankhe will be sharing with us about public infrastructure and township developments, as well as Tata's sustainability initiatives and plans. Over to you, Mr. Sankhe. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mano. So it was amazing hearing all the three speakers and of course, 
everyone put different perspective to the same topic and it was very intriguing to see that uh, so hello everyone let's start by looking at the first word which is sustainable infrastructure sustainability could mean different things to different people and context right uh, so for the sustainable infrastructure i thought sustainability would have four different dimensions okay economic sustainability which refers to the long term growth economic and financial social sustainability which refers to all the social issues related to well being to cultural preservation all aspects institutional uh, sustainability which is about uh, ensuring the objectives of of the inst institutions are met and of course the environmental one which is the res responsibility to conserve the natural resources uh, climate and basically make sure that we preserve our planet so it's something which we have not doing and that's why this fourth dimension it makes sense for me to concentrate on that it's because by ignoring it we have potentially initiated a catastrophic climatic change which is endangering the entire humanity this is what climate change looks like this is a starving polar bear and the climate change is hitting us closer and closer every time to closer to the home extreme weather conditions are causing wildfires droughts in some place and the floods in other and people at the bottom of the pyramid are most vulnerable and they are getting most impacted by this there are a lot of reasons for it but the main one is that we are adding a lot of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere every year in fact 51 billion of them 51 billion tons of them so we would i would rather quantify the crux of sustainability as this number 51 billion which needs to ultimately come down to zero it's not 25 it's not 10 it should come down to zero because that's when we will avoid the worst effect of climatic change and that's where also the opportunity is to bring it from 51 to 0 remember this is the matter of survival and when it is survival it will find its sense of urgency to everything including the government policy matters so sustainability is going to be everyone's business and probably it's going to be one of the biggest businesses so let's break this 51 billion tons further into understanding where the opportunity lies in even deeper manner although much of the discussion about climate change is focused on electricity generation making electricity accounts for just one quarter of all the emissions so when i first started uh, quantifying things this was a surprise to me and i know what you are thinking about you know clean electricity and clean electricity is not going to bring it to zero because we don't have enough surface area on the earth neither land or water uh, neither do we have reliable supply of uh, wind and solar throughout the year the number one culprit of greenhouse gases is when we make stuff or build them because when we do that we use a lot of cement steel and plastics and all of these innovations are amazing innovations by human kind and very essential ones but they emit a lot of greenhouse gases for example cement constitutes 6% of the entire uh, uh, greenhouse gases on the earth agriculture forestry and other land uses contribute further 19% so raising animals for food such as beef is a major contributor of greenhouse emissions even growing crops to harvesting trees has an impact this includes deforestation and other land uses transportation is about 16% and its aviation and trucking and shipping not the passenger cars that account for all the emissions uh, growth th in this sector uh you know if you look at the data pandemic has brought down just 5% of the total greenhouse gases emission last year 
and last one is our cooling and heating needs it's not just the electricity that our air conditioners consume but it's also the refrigerants which ultimately leak out so there you go developing sustainable infrastructure is very very important for ultimately the survival of the humanity the world uh, when i look at this investment uh, that is going to be done over next 10 years almost 90 trillion world over is going to get invested in sustainable infrastructure and of course government is going to play a major role in every one of uh, that and so let's quickly look at what india is thinking uh, some of it has already been covered earlier so i'm not going to go very deep into that uh, uh, the first speaker covered the national infrastructure pipeline that india has come up with and uh, this is uh, going to be about 1.4 trillion dollars spent on infrastructure over next 5 years uh mid last year this report was released by the government the report emphasizes the need for sustainability and uh, provides statistics for all aspects of infrastructure development uh such as this you know you can see uh the kind of goals that kpis that government has put for itself uh it also talks about the new technology and vinamra talked about it how it is important in infrastructure thinking and i see increasingly private sector also going for this it was not there a few years back but it's coming at a very rapid pace uh government appreciates that uh, infrastructure building will impact each one of the 17 goals sustainable infrastructure development goals sorry sustainable development goals of un which is un sdg 17 uh you know this this picture depicts that infrastructure building impacting each and every one of the 17 goals uh if you want to read more about it it's uh, uh, on this website you know there are opportunities which are clearly listed there so you might want to go and explore those uh one of the trends which we all are seeing uh is the big urbanization and uh, uh you know we are also part of uh, building some of the sustainable uh infrastructure for that 50% of uh, uh population is going to be based in urban areas and that's when this is important for us so how do we develop net zero townships uh when when we we look at it uh you know we start from the very beginning about sustainable architectural design and i'm giving you all this information because uh there is a opportunity to do better in all these and i would love to hear from all of you uh what more we can do we are doing a part of it and i would love to hear from you guys uh how this could be done better uh you know this is uh this is in abu dhabi uh, when you go from dubai to abu dhabi you see this building so we are looking at uh, smart standing shading high performance facades every every aspect of it uh you know the and even at the planning stage the beam 3d 4d is very important we are using it we would love to know about more products and more technologies in this space from you uh reusing and repurposing waste including the construction waste is very important so uh please reach out to any one of us with that uh the next one is of course the low carbon transport system so uh, tata projects is involved in building metro lines in multiple cities of course uh, light rail cycle routes public electric uh, buses evs charging infra all are very important in this space uh and it's even the low tech which is important you know we we plan a forest which has grown this dense in 18 months so uh there's a specific technique for it called miyawaki forest and uh, it grows 10 times faster it is 30 times more dense and hence captures 40 times more carbon so we are looking at such technologies as well and and this could be grown in as little as 1000 2000 square feet so every even a villa project every villa this could be uh, uh developed in the township large portions could be developed 
uh, you see beautiful biodiversity coming back. So all these aspects are very, very important. And more importantly, if it is a township, you can use recycle the wastewater and start uh, you know, having uh, water requirement for this. By the way, this doesn't require water after two years. We are looking very deeply in IoT. Uh, uh, you know, the wastewater, how the resources are used during the construction, IoT helps us track it. So we have a whole sustainability uh, uh, enabled um, IoT monitoring process over here. Uh, 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 you know, we, we also put IoT in um, other electrical uh, consumption spaces such as HVAC, which is 60% of the electricity consumption and then remotely monitor and control it in order to save the electricity. So we are looking at the technologies in such similar spaces as well always. Uh, okay, there are, I see opportunity in, uh, you know, as diverse field as uh, collecting and using the data, big data, the GIS, GPS, worker safety is very, very important for us. So we are looking at all the aspects which you see on the screen right now. Uh, so, so there is, uh, so these are some of the ground uh, opportunities which are live and you can focus on them in the long term uh, as well. So, so let's look at some of the long term opportunities now. Uh, you know, what are the billion dollar opportunities? So let me spend the last three minutes that I have on uh, uh, thinking about the long term and billion dollar opportunities. Uh, the big buck is where uh, solving the big problems are. So what are those problems in category of uh, agriculture, forestry and land use? 41% of the deforestation happens due to beef production. Animal husbandry consumes 30 to 50% of the land area. Now to solve this problem in 2011, they founded a startup called Impossible Foods. Impossible Foods creates meat from plants. It tastes exactly same as the beef, costs much less. And this is one of their offering, not just one offering, there are many offerings. And the company is now valued above $4 billion. Uh, New climate, smart crops and livestock are another area. Zero carbon fertilizer is another area which we look at now. Coming to the infrastructure building space, we saw that uh, uh, cement, steel, plastics, important uh, contributor. So let's see each one of them getting disrupted. Okay, For Forterra has developed a new cementitious material that reduces CO2 emission by 60% and provide savings to the client, both OPEX, CAPEX savings. Remember, we need to have zero carbon cement, okay? So there are a lot of other technologies like 3D printed construction technologies, which reduces the material tonnage, which are also gonna to contribute towards this. Similarly, we need zero carbon steel and we also need innovations, which uh, reduces the requirement of the steel. For example, 90% of the steel used in the car can be reduced by using the stronger polymers. Uh, over to the electricity, uh, uh, you know, biofuels are very important. Uh, then grid scale electricity storage that can have a full season lasting is also very important. The nuclear fission fusion is very important. In fact, this is probably the most important electricity generation technology in the future. Uh, for how, how do we reduce footprint of cooling and heating? You know, just to help you uh, think uh, differently, View Glasses has over $1 billion valuation. SoftBank has invested in it. What they do is that they have smart glasses, which automatically uh, turns darker uh, when the room needs to be cooler and lighter when the room needs to be warmer. Uh, you can control these shades by your by a mobile app also. It's, it's electronically controlled. So, uh, uh, that's about it. One last uh, very important application, uh, which is carbon capture. Uh, you know, what if all these things don't work? Then we need to go and catch all the carbon which we have released in the atmosphere and which we are going to release. Okay, big business. So uh, this competition is funded by Elon Musk and the Musk Foundation. It's open for all. So you can apply, I can apply, and we can win $50, billion, uh, $50 million dollar first prize into this total purse uh, is $100 million. And you can read more about this on xprize.org. Who knows, you know, some of you uh, 
uh, might uh, win this and probably create a billion dollar organization out of uh, the thoughts that we are discussing now. So that's about it. Thanks a lot, everyone. And uh, oh, yes. And you will, uh, if you want more reference, you can, uh, all that I've talked about today is there on my blog at samsunki.com. So please feel free to look for that and, uh, you know, look for your references. So yeah, over to you, Anna. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanke, for that meaningful presentation, as well as um, shedding a little bit more light about Tata's sustainability initiatives and plans. Our next speaker is Mr. Andrew McCoon, who is the Executive Director for SMEC and its parent company, Sabana Jurong, in India. He has been a part of SMEC for the past 10 years, and Mr. McCoon has 14 years' experience as a built environment professional he has been involved in management, execution, and strategic guidance for projects in the transport, water, and urban sectors across Africa, South Asia, and Central Asia. Mr. McCoon will be sharing with us on the railways, metro high-speed rails, as well as water infrastructure opportunities in India. Mr. McCoon, please. Thank you, Vanna. Um... Yeah, we can just, uh, I think, Francis, if you're sharing the slides, you can just quickly flash through the first nine slides. It gives a brief, brief overview of our company. As mentioned, we're part of the Savannah Jerome Group. Um, I think from a sustainability perspective, uh, most interesting thing there is um, Savannah Jerome Group uh, in February uh, of this year successfully launched the first uh, Singapore dollar linked uh, or denominated sustainability link bond. So as an organization, we are placing sustainability at the center of everything that we do. Um, the, the company that we're really going to focus on today is, is SMEC, which is uh, the infrastructure um, sister or infrastructure entity. And in particular, focused on three sectors, um, as mentioned by Mana. Next slide. Thank you. And next so just a, a quick overview of uh, our presence in the uh, rail market here in India. Um, already the, the speakers that have gone ahead have mentioned um, a number of the uh, railway opportunities that exist. Um, and I'd like to just take you through some of the, the current projects that we've been involved in. And then also uh, spend majority of the time talking about um, where we see opportunities in, in the rail sector moving forward. Next slide. So uh, metro developments have, have been something at the center um, of uh, sustainable transport solutions in India uh, for uh, a number of decades, um, trying to uh, dense uh, or, or densify urban corridors. Um, and uh, this is obviously one of the, the best ways or easiest ways to uh, transfer the most amount of people uh, from point A to point B. Next. I think the, the, the most important thing to link uh, to notice uh, or to make note of here is the need to really practice uh, integrated uh, corridor development practices. We've uh, touched or one of the previous speakers touched on transit oriented developments. And I think that uh, is, is something that needs a lot of improvement here in India, uh, particularly from a sustainability perspective. The, the live work play scenario is not uh, completed without uh, uh, a good and effective transport solution. Next, thank you. You can skip to the next slide. So where, where are we really looking towards? Um, next slide, uh, in, the, in the coming decades. So this is the, the traditional railway sector, um, which is uh, predominantly heavy haul railway, and then uh, also into your metro stations. Still, uh, government of India and, and the various railway bodies in India are looking at uh, redeveloping stations, um, some 90 odd stations that they are looking at uh, uh, focus on transit oriented development and proper integrated uh, um, uh, transport solutions. Um, dedicated freight, the DFCC corridors were mentioned, the Eastern and Western corridors uh, by one of the previous speakers. Um, and then obviously looking at 100% elect electrification of the broad gauge. Uh, um, uh, railway network. Next slide. I think uh, one of the biggest buzzwords at the moment in the rail sector is uh, high-speed rail, um, and in particular the the routes that are going to be coming up in the in the next decade. Um, 
Tata Projects, I think the previous speaker uh, has been involved in uh, um, bidding and, and, and winning some of these uh, routes as well. I think uh, it's important to understand how this technology has developed over time in uh, places like Japan and China uh, and France um, and how quickly this has spread. So I think what we also need to understand is what impact is this going to have uh, in terms of our ability to um, create transit oriented developments around these key stations um, and what will that what will that look like um, and how will that be planned from an integrated manner next slide obviously uh, in terms of sustainability and I think that the previous speakers uh, spoke on economic uh, sustainability from a transport perspective it's obviously very important to understand where the funds are going to come from particularly here in India, the, the tax base relies on uh, significant uh, um, external investment or foreign direct investment um, into transport uh, technologies and transport sectors. So a couple of op uh, uh, options or, um, that are being discussed at the moment is Metro Light. Um, this is really a light urban rail uh, transit system. Um, there are benefits, but obviously also cons to this. Um, so it is cheaper than uh, the traditional uh, uh, underground or elevated metro, but uh, also takes uh, far less, uh, less people. Um, it is a lot quicker to implement, um, but again, from a, a land use perspective, being uh, above ground or on ground or at ground level at grade, um, it does also play with the overall uh, integrated uh, ability um, uh, you know, from a community-based approach. Next, please. The next concept uh, that is being discussed, um, and I think uh, standards were, were released only in November 2020 by Government of India, is something called Metro Neo. Um, and this looks really at, uh, you know, uh, rubber-based uh, wheels. So rather than uh, a, a train track, there'll be rubber wheels but also, uh, um, you know, um, electrified as well. Um, and this is something, again, uh, only really for much smaller um, capacity lines, um, but also is uh, significantly cheaper than some of the other mechanisms um, that are currently available. I think then uh, just onto um, the uh, water infrastructure. Um, I think here in, in India, um, well, anywhere in the world, really, um, water is, is the lifeblood. It's, uh, it's the new oil. Uh, the wars of the future are, are likely to be fought around who has the, the most sustainable type of water supply. So really, uh, if we look at supply, um, which is coming from, from either uh, irrigation channels, uh, pump storage projects, uh, dams, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's something that uh, that government of India has really invested in uh, very heavily. Um, there's a number of different uh, schemes that are available, and, and previous speakers uh, had mentioned, you know, through Jal Shakti Ministry, um, the Jal Jeevan Mission, uh, uh, Nalse Jal Scheme, and things like that, which are looking at by 2024-2025 uh, investing over 30,000 crore or Indian crore. Uh, uh, into ensuring that uh, everybody in the country has a piped water supply to their uh, to their houses. So I think you know this is uh, from a sustain sustainability perspective. Um, this is really looking at uh, at how to provide infrastructure to people. You can go to the next slide. Infrastructure to people in the most sustainable manner. So what becomes very difficult in a country like India, where uh, which is uh, uh, very very vast is the ability to, to then respond to these government uh, initiatives or government objectives in the most sustainable manner and sustainable mechanisms. So that is really what, uh, what us as, as uh, consulting engineers or infrastructure specialists are, are busy grappling with at the moment um, in, in the, in the uh, 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 water-based um, sector. I think most importantly here is also dealing with uh, tariff charges and how uh, we start to manage water, water loss uh, management in these schemes. Um, many different uh, contractors are also getting involved to, to come up with uh, um, operating periods where they'll take, take over this infrastructure and operate it on behalf of the government um, for a, a period of 20 odd years. And uh, in that way, 
um, the, the government of India is, is trying to ensure that water loss management is taken care of by the downstream uh, investors. Next slide. I think uh, th this is just an example of uh, a program which looked at modernizing the uh, irrigation system infrastructure. Um, again, uh, irrigation was spoken about or, or farming and agriculture was spoken about as a key concept. Uh, this particular project looks at how you can uh, uh, more sustainably focus on irrigation activities and initiatives um, and really looking at uh, optimization of resources. Next. I think finally, from a, a, a water perspective, um, this particular project follows the 150 uh, megaliter desal plant that has already been commissioned in Chennai. Um, this, this particular slide looks at the 400 MLD plant, again, with uh, uh, foreign direct investments. Um, uh, desalination is, is not the most cost-effective uh, water supply solution. However, we have found that government of India is starting to turn uh, to these uh, uh, alternate technologies um, that are available in the Middle East and other parts of the world um, uh, to, to try and, and, and deal with critical water supply issues. Chennai specifically, uh, as, as, a, as a large urban population, has for many, many decades really battled with water supply. Um, what this project is, is quite unique uh, in, in, in our opinion, is it's the ability to take it from source through treatment all the way to the, uh, um, the, the tap or the connection point of the household. So it's dealing with it, uh, it will be a decade long project by the time it's, it's finished. Um, and that will be uh, slowly moving into the construction phases now. Next. Yeah, just quickly on, uh, on some urban development, you can just flip through. So uh, our, our company also uh, specializes and in, in, um, having uh, originated from Singapore, um, specializes in uh, um, uh, SEZs or IDZs um, that are looking at uh, a focus on specific sectors. And I think really, uh, again, to reiterate uh, uh, what a previous um, uh, uh, speaker has mentioned, the need to focus on sort of smart city management and digital infrastructure management in any of these uh, um, projects that are coming up. Next. Um, this is also the, the picture that I've got uh, behind me. Um, you know, also looking at not just the, uh, the impact on small scale or, or single uh, plot size, but ultimately, you know, what can become in terms of a sustainable development uh, at a citywide or region wide level. I think it's very important to understand the, um, the mix and the, and the dynamic of the land uses and how these will generate, whether it be traffic, uh, whether it will be uh, commercial developments, et cetera, et cetera, and how they all link together. Next. Um, again, transit oriented developments have been uh, discussed in India for some time, uh, implemented with uh, various uh, um, levels of success. It is something that needs uh, a, a lot more discussion. Um, I think the, the, the team from Capital Land as well has been looking at a number of these aspects um, and uh, it definitely is something that is, is required. Next. So just, I think for me uh, to, to summarize uh, four or five unique uh, uh, aspects at the moment in India. Um, uh, the, number one is uh, Atmanarbar Bharat which uh, uh, translates into self-reliant India. I think that is something that uh, government of India and, and prime minister of India um, has really been pushing. I think, you know, what, what we as infrastructure specialists or as the infrastructure community need to continue to push for is that uh, we don't want to limit or stop uh, um, foreign uh, investment, foreign thought, foreign technologies in terms of sustainable practices here in India. So um, in terms of how companies get involved, um, uh, I think it's important to understand what, what this particular uh, government-led initiative is going to, to mean for infrastructure professionals and companies. Um, new technologies and new thoughts. For us, uh, you know, anytime that you try to approach a new technology or push a new technology onto a client, um, the, the, the first question is, where has this been done before? And I think um, you know, we need to, as a, as a group uh, of infrastructure specialists, we need to really push 
push our clients to think beyond that because you know I, I think as the previous speaker said what is going to be the next big uh, big thing to come and uh, to try and really push clients to think beyond and think uh, beyond just their current project but what could really be a game changer from a global perspective uh, integrated developments I, I have mentioned already but uh, that is is always going to be a need um, and uh, we need to push that no matter which which client, which specific, whether it's public or private sector, whoever's getting involved, there must be that integrated approach that is bigger than just the project um, to really uh, leverage the sustainable development goals. I think, um, you know, second to last point for me is uh, there's always going to be that need to balance basic uh, infrastructure levels of service, particularly in developing countries or developing economies like India. Um, and, and how to blend uh, the need to provide basic water with uh, the ability to do it in a very sustainable manner. So I don't think anybody here uh, is um, uh, against uh, the, you know, the need to provide basic water supply, um, but how to do it in the most sustainable manner is something that we still need to, to understand better. And then I think finally, um, and I was, I was very pleased uh, for, for the uh, Capital Land colleague to mention, um, you know, that they are, are driving their contractors or their um, building consultants uh, to measure sustainability. From my perspective, I think we need to push for uh, government of India in particular to start rewarding uh, or incentivizing sustainable solutions and actually measuring them. Because I think until that happens, you will not get... Uh, everybody in the supply chain to really push for uh, sustainable infrastructure and sustainable developments. Um, I think that's uh, that's it for me. Um, I'll hand back to you, Mana. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McCoon, for sharing about the opportunities in India in, in the respective areas, like railways, metro high-speed rails, as well as water infrastructure. We now have with us Mr. Anoop Matthew, Senior VP and Business Head, Godrej Construction. Mr. Matthew heads Godrej Construction, which is one of the 14 business units of Godrej and Boyce Manufacturing. In his current role, Mr. Matthew is responsible for GNB's real estate and construction business. And Godrej Construction has, in fact, helped conceptualize, plan, and develop over 10 million square feet of real estate assets across several locations within India. Mr. Matthew is also the chairman of the board of directors at the Institute for Lean Construction Excellence, India. Mr. Matthew will be sharing with us about the residential infrastructure developments, trends, and opportunities. Mr. Matthew, please. Thank you, Mano. Uh, and firstly, thanks for inviting me uh, into this session. Uh, am I audible? I hope I'm audible. It, yes, you are. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So uh, my, um, my intent today is to talk about a few things that we at Godrej have been doing with regard to sustainable development and also uh, sharing our thoughts on uh, where we are heading and where, would, where we would like to partner with others uh, in other countries who can uh, help us on this journey on sustainability. So next slide, please. So my uh, presentation today has three parts. Uh, I'll begin with setting, a con setting the context of the company and what do we do? Uh, and also the second part is about our commitment to sustainable development. And finally, uh, I will give some project references as to what we have done to demonstrate our commitment to sustainable development. And where is it that we would be open to uh, learning something from others as well? Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. So the Godrej Group is a, a well-established uh, uh, conglomerate, uh, almost 125 years old now. Uh, it's a very diversified company with uh, uh, right from white goods and appliances to aerospace and consumer products through to real estate. Uh, we are in, the group is present in 80 countries across the world. And Godrej and Boyce, which is uh, the, group, uh, the part of the group which I'm, I'm, I'm working for, uh, is present in uh, 
23 locations across the country with over uh, 3,700 acres of land and over 12 million square feet, which we uh, own and most of which is manufacturing uh, plants, but we also lease office spaces uh, to others. Next, please. So if you've been to Mumbai, uh, this would be easy to relate to. Uh, we uh, are in a place called Vikroli and a good part of Vikroli actually belongs to Godrej. Uh, next, please. Over the years, the city has grown uh, from where it was in South Mumbai, which is shown here in Fort and Worli. Uh, it has moved more towards the north, and Vikroli has become more central to the overall development uh, within the island city, as well as uh, the other parts of the hinterland uh, around Mumbai city. Next, please. Uh, if you can see here, we have a uh, resident, it's an industrial township which was developed way back in 19, uh, the late 1940s, uh, early 1950s. So the portions shown in the, in the pink are the portions which are predominantly the industrial uh, activities and office and business district activities. Uh, we have over 20 industrial buildings and we manufacture various kinds of uh, products uh, from this place. The ones in the blue are the residential colonies. Uh, we have over 4,000 apartments and various dwelling units uh, within this place, which mostly caters to our own staff uh, with, who commute to work from the, to the in industrial and office premises from the uh, residential colonies. If what you see in the green is largely what we conserve as mangroves, uh, almost uh, uh, 2,000 acres uh, we have been conserving over the last uh, several decades from 19, uh, late 1940s uh, through until now. We have been conserving these mangroves as our, as in a commitment towards uh, environment and we believe that this is uh, one of the lungs of the city of Mumbai which otherwise has become pretty much a concrete jungle. Next please. Talking a little bit about the market environment, and I'm sure some of the people who are in uh, Singapore would be interested in looking at how this is uh, playing out. Next, please. The real estate commercial uh, office segment uh, is has been growing very well, and has has also been emphasized uh, in some of the, by the earlier speakers. And I won't get into the statistics here, but uh, generally there has been a good growth in this sector, uh, commercial office spaces. And uh, we see this, uh, while this has taken a little bit of a, uh, a, a difficult detour for the moment because of the prevailing pandemic in most parts of the country and even across the world, uh, but we are not uh, completely pessimistic in the long run. We feel this, uh, this space will play out far better and a gray day office spaces will still continue to uh, play a very dominant role when it comes to uh, the development of cities. Next, please. On the residential uh, sector for real estate, uh, we see uh, over the last few years, there has been a great amount of development on the residential sector. Uh, the current uh, shape of things have, there has been a little bit of an overhang uh, of the inventory. And uh, because of that, uh, the pace had slowed down. However, in the last, uh, two, three months uh, because of certain government policies, uh, more specifically in uh, Mumbai, there has been a, a positive development. But across the country, uh, there is a, a huge need to fulfill uh, this un, uh, unmet uh, need of uh, accommodation for the masses. Next, please. So the asset classes, which uh, we think will play out more largely in the, in the days to come, uh, there's an increasing focus in the industrial and uh, warehousing sector. Uh, we also think the data center and the commercial office spaces, these will play out far more. The residential space, as I said, will continue to play a, a part, but uh, because of the excess, uh, excess inventory, which is currently uh, there, it may have some sort of a, a temporary blip, but uh, it's not to say that uh, this will not improve. Uh, it's 
it, it depends on the product and which markets are you bringing these products. In. I won't touch each of these other uh, asset classes, uh, but uh, retail has had its share of problems because of the pandemic and some of the other uh, classes like the co-working, co-living, et cetera, are uh, slowly going to find a place. The hospitality sector, uh, once again, has also had a significant mean delta blow because of the pandemic. And it uh, will continue to linger for some time before it starts improving. Next, please. Coming to the next part of my presentation, which is our, about our commitment to sustainable development and why it's important for all of us uh, to be conscious about sustainable development. Uh, let me go to the next slide, please. So I'll begin with what uh, Mr. Jamshed Godrej, our chairman and managing director has stated and in, in so many words uh, that we are basing our own business strategy on the principles of good and green, good being good for the society and green being environmentally conscious and all our product designs and the way we manufacture and produce and construct, uh, our intent is to consciously be aware of this and uh, uh, develop uh, products and services which will uh, meet uh, this expectation of the, of the company. Next, please. Coming to the, the next part, we this is just to, again, to show, demonstrate our commitment. Uh, it's one thing to say many things about sustainability, but are we putting the money where the mouth is? Uh, so way back in 2003, Godrej had committed to uh, about 20,000 square feet uh, uh, construction, which was the CII uh, Center of Excellence, the Godrej Green Building Center at Hyderabad. Uh, this was to demonstrate the first platinum rated building. Uh, this was the first LEED certified platinum rated uh, building within India. And this was again a demonstration. This center of excellence uh, today has helped many other uh, companies and other entities within the, within the country to establish as much as 7 point, uh, over 7 billion square feet uh, over the last few years. And the target is to move towards a 10 billion square feet green building footprint by 2022. Next, please. So as I said, uh, it's important to demonstrate commitment. Conservation of our mangroves, which is several hundred acres of mangroves, uh, is one again, uh, one such uh, uh, commitment which we have uh, uh, adhered to and would like to demonstrate. This has several uh, plant species, very diverse, uh, over several bird species and butterflies and, and various kinds of uh, crabs and reptiles out there. Uh, when we did a township uh, a, a biodiversity index assessment, we found that our uh, biodiversity index was uh, 63 points out of the 92 points. Uh, incidentally, I'm aware that Singapore values this uh, and uses this biodiversity index very well. And I thought it pertinent to uh, highlight this and how uh, we ourselves are doing a little small bit uh, in the last, uh, in the large uh, scheme of things in the context of India's development. We want to demonstrate how uh, green buildings can be constructed and how we can look at uh, integrated township um, planning and development and how to ensure, ensure that the sustainable uh, development is there uh, and making sure that the environment commitment is uh, adhered to as well. Next, please. So this is the ecosystem. It uh, has already sequestered uh, carbon of 9.5 lakh uh, tons of carbon. Uh, every year, about 60,000 tons gets added to this by, by conserving this uh, mangroves. It's very diverse in terms of the wildlife there. And it also has uh, livelihoods of fisher folks who, who use this uh, area. Next, please. So to come to Godrej Construction, and I'll quickly cover this part uh, just to highlight what is the role that we have played. Next, please. So Godrej Construction has uh, Godrej Real Estate leasing business, uh, where we off lease office spaces and other industrial buildings uh, to others. Uh, we have a property development business, which is into selling of residential and other uh, real estate assets. Uh, and also we have a construction materials business. Over and above that, we also support uh, all the real estate support functions 
uh, in terms of managing the estate and the various uh, infrastructure in terms of water, storm water drain, waste, waste management, etc. Next, please. So this was how it began in 1948. Uh, this was pretty much uh, barren and not too much of development. Uh, but since then, uh, it has developed a lot. Uh, next, please. This is how uh, the, the township looks like today. Uh, it's a lot more greener, and uh, we've consciously made an effort to uh, develop this in a more sustainable way. Next, please. So this is another bird's eye view uh, of, uh, of the township. This is only a part of the industrial township, uh, and you can see some of the uh, real estate developments that we have uh, brought about over the years. Next, please. So if you see our purpose, vision, and values, in our values, we have emphasized on the environment, and this is a commitment which we intend to honor, uh, and that's what we are very committed towards. And in whenever we product, make a product or sell a product or develop a new asset class in real estate. Next, please. So as I said, this is a township, so it has its uh, residential colonies, uh, it has schools, hospitals, uh, uh, and entertainment and amenities and clubhouse, etc. Next, please. So some project references to show our commitment to green. Next, please. So this is a residential complex. And here again, we've seen, uh, we've got a good uh, platinum rating for this project. It's an IGBC platinum rated building. It's ranked amongst the, amongst the best in the country, uh, amongst multi-dwelling units. Uh, next, please. Uh, this building is a uh, IT park, and uh, uh, this has been this is about 1.5 million square feet. Each floor plate is uh, around 150,000 square feet, and it's also a LEED platinum rated uh, core and shell category building. Next, please. Uh, this building uh, also has about 100,000 square feet of a, a garden rooftop, uh, which I think again uh, many parts of the world, including Singapore. Uh, have used the rooftops very effectively. Uh, so this is another demonstration of uh, commitment to uh, green. Next, please. This building uh, is our plan number 13 and X. And here it's the first, uh, India's first uh, IGBC net zero energy rated uh, building. Uh, again, it's a platinum certified building. Next, please. This is a uh, uh, ongoing development, the first phase of about a million square feet of industrial campus is being constructed in our 400 acre campus in Kalapur on the way from Mumbai to Pune. Uh, again, uh, we have got a pre-certified platinum rated uh, rating for this as well. Next, please. Uh, once again, construction and demolition uh, waste uh, is a very serious concern. As cities grow, uh, we need to find better solutions to how we are going to use the construction uh, waste. And uh, this is uh, to demonstrate this, we have a recycled concrete manufacturing plant where we use uh, the recycled concrete from various parts of the city. Uh, we pulverize it and then make it into blocks, pavers, and other uh, concrete components. We have also a ready mix concrete uh, plant, which is also certified by IGBC for it. It is the first uh, Green Pro certified uh, 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 ready mix concrete plant in India. Next, please. These are some of the products which are made out of recycled uh, product, uh, recycled materials, and uh, there is no compromise on the quality of the product. It is actually uh, meeting or exceeding the criteria, which are the Indian the standards for the same. Next, please. We have also done our bit to help uh, the government and the coastal road project in introducing recycled materials in uh, the box culverts for which is being constructed for the coastal road project in Mumbai. And this is one way to help uh, the city become more sustainable. Next, please. Next, please. So other than sustainability, our N NPS scores for customers are uh, very encouraging. In fact, they've been in the range of 80, above 80 uh, for the last several uh, years now and many of our uh, lines of business. Our net promoter scores are, uh, are in the range of 80, uh, 79 to 78 to 84 uh, NPS scores, which is uh, pretty excellent by uh, most international standards. And we value our customers 
uh, feedback and work on those areas for improvement. Next, please. Uh, also on safety, we have got several national awards uh, and international awards on this uh, in this to demonstrate our commitment. Next, please. Uh, our feedback from employees has also been improving over the last few years. Next, please. To conclude my last slide, we value our partners and we take their feedback very seriously. And uh, when we do independent assessment of their feedback, we found that we've had very good scores when it comes to partner feedback as well. And we uh, genuinely feel that this is an area which we further need to strengthen. Next, please. So with this, I have uh, concluded my uh, presentation. Um, uh, Mano, I'm, thank you very much. I'm handing it back to you, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Matthew, for sharing with us about the residential infrastructure developments, trends, the opportunities, as well as, of course, the work that uh, Godrej is actually doing in the sustainability sphere. So now our final speaker is Mr. Prakrut Mehta, Director, ESR India. Mr. Mehta has worked exclusively in the real estate sector for the last 23 years. Before ESR India, Mr. Mehta was a consultant at Tricorex Countrywide, a tech startup into the real estate services. Prior to that, he held positions of country manager at AOS Studley India, executive director at Knight Frank India, and AGM sales at Peninsula Land Limited. Mr. Mehta will be sharing with us on the outlook of data centers and ESR's GV with the Government of Singapore Investment Corporation on industrial and logistic assets in India. Over to you, Mr. Mehta. Thank you, Manolama, and uh, welcome all. I really appreciate uh, the chance of speaking here. And I, you know, it's always a little tough to be the last speaker, so I'm going to keep it very short and crisp. Uh, the next slide, please. Good. So I'm, I'm only going to talk a little bit about ESR, the sustainability initiative that we have taken in India. And finally, a little bit on the data center and what we are doing with GIC. Uh, please feel free to stop me in case you really want to and have any questions, or you can just put it up in the chat and I'd be more than happy to answer them. So quickly about ESR, uh, we started our India journey uh, not too very long ago, just about three years. Just to give a little background to who we are, uh, for most people who may not know us, but we are one of the largest investors uh, in the industrial and logistics sector. And uh, we have been here you know, trying to make uh, the Indian, in, Indian, Indian infrastructure, especially for the logistics and industrial real estate, into a more robust one than what it was. Next. Uh, simply, uh, if I were to say what we do, we invest, we build, and we manage uh, logistics and industrial parks of global standards across the APAC region. We are probably one of the largest. The next slides will show you uh, that in detail. So we are a Singapore registered company. We operate out of Australia, Japan, South Korea, China, and of course, India. Uh, not to mention we are growing uh, exponentially in the APAC region. So we are looking at uh, adding Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, and, and other uh, emerging markets. At the last count, uh, we had, we were, in fact, rather we are managing $22 billion, which probably is growing. Uh, and if, if I were to say the portfolio size is about 170 million square feet uh, today. Uh, we are obviously a HKSE listed company uh, very recently. And uh, I, I'm quite proud to say we have been doing very, very well and stable. Next. Thank you. This is the snapshot of our India presence. Uh, so you can see with the flags around, uh, we are present across uh, all critical markets in India, starting with Mumbai, Pune. So we are quite well concentrated in North and South, as you can see. And of course, uh, uh, some key markets in the in the East as well, uh, which is called Kolkata. Next. Uh, just a few snapshots of the kind of developments that ESR has been doing across the world. So you can look at Singapore, uh, China, Japan. I mean, we've been doing very, very, uh, I would say, high quality, grade A kind of industrial and logistics infrastructure, including uh, you know distribution centers, which is the need of the hour today, um, including uh, large ones in places like Tokyo or Shanghai, or even uh, you know, planning some of them in India, which are multi-level distribution centers going up to about a million square feet distributed over four floors. Next. And uh, just to give you a quick uh, head, 
or rather quick background. In India, we are located in 10 locations. We have about 15 parks active, which are under development. Uh, about 700 acres of land parcel that we own today, and it would roughly translate into about 81 odd buildings. Next. Uh, here's how our portfolio looks like today. We have already completed about close to about 1.69 million square feet, which is about 11 odd buildings. As we talk right now, we have already signed up about 11 odd buildings, which is 2.69 million square feet. And they are already you know, in progress and the handover is happening as we speak uh, in the next two to three months. Uh, there, 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 is a, there is a total reserve of about 8.6 million square feet, which we intend to start developing in the year 21, 22. Uh, next, please. So this is just a bird's eye view of our Indian portfolio. We have developed something for uh, BMW. This is their uh, first uh, regional distribution center for the West. Uh, on the right, you can see a bird's eye view of our park in Liberia. The buildings you see are for uh, Flipkart and it was one of their first distribution centers that they developed in the Eastern side of the country. Uh, it's about uh, over a little more than a half a million square feet. Uh, next. Uh, what the future holds for us, I'm just going to talk about three key things. So we are looking at new market, uh, new locations. Of course, we have identified tier two, tier three cities as well. Uh, we are driven by consumption growth. I mean, that's obvious. And of course, the growth in manufacturing sector. So currently, we may be existing in top uh, tier one cities in the country, but we are looking at going to every place from uh, a Bhubaneswar to a Vijayawada uh, across the length and breadth of the country. Uh, we see very, very strong uh, opportunities in the data center business. And I'm going to talk a little bit on that as well as we go further. Uh, cold chains, which are critical and key element of uh, development in, in India. So we, are, we have identified cold chain as a very, very important part of our business. And we are now looking at developing multiple cold chain with partnerships with some key cold chain players in the country. R&D parks and green manufacturing is another uh, key element which is on our on our radar and uh, the park in Mumbai, Pune, and Chennai are actually dedicated for R and D and green manufacturing. Lastly, we have uh, I, I heard uh, you know my colleague from uh, Capital Land talking about technology, and uh, so I won't really get into much of it. But yes, we have invested big time into IoT. Uh, I'll talk about it in the following slides, and we are working on various solutions related to blockchain and on-demand uh, warehousing technology. Also, next. So a little bit on sustainability. I think everybody has already spoken about sustainability. So I would restrict myself to just about one single slide. Uh, next. Uh, here's what uh, we've been doing. So to start with, you know, we, we have a state of the art smart infrastructure across uh, whenever we plan a park across uh, the country. Um, it is obviously coming from our global presence and you know, the, the various innovations that we keep doing in countries like Japan or China or Singapore which we are now implementing in, in India. We have been, uh, we've been adhering to all the requirements of IGBC and all our parks are de facto uh, IGBC green, certif uh, green certified, either gold or platinum rating. Uh, water, we have realized, you know, logistics park and industrial parks are a huge uh, water consumption zones and uh, water in general, wherever we are present, Availability of water is a big, big, big issue. So we have done our initiatives and we have ensured that we reduce water usage at our parks by about 35 watt percent. Not to mention energy is another big, big uh, you know, in industrial parks. And we've been doing everything from uh, you know, sustainable uh, perspective of doing uh, rooftop uh, solar panels and uh, smart metering, etc. Not to mention we are now looking at you know, tying up with uh, solar energy vendors you know, to ensure that we provide you not know, the sustainable energy, but also at a, at, a, at a fair price as compared to what uh, one would pay. So we intend to make our parks not only sustainable, but also affordable for uh, the large logistics and industrial players in the country. Next, please. Uh, this is just a gist of uh, the platform that we developed. It's an IoT-based platform completely in the cloud. Every occupier of uh, ESR parks in the country uh, gets an access to this once they start off with us. And what it does is uh, it obviously does 
contactless uh, entry and exit management. Uh, industrial and logistics paths are prone to a lot of traffic flow of trucks, and uh, there is there is a dire need to manage these these traffic. So we we have integrated uh, you know, parking and trucking management uh, in this particular app. So to, to just make it very easy for you to understand, uh, what you can do is you can plan your entire uh, fleet management uh, movement, fleet, not fleet management, but fleet movement on this app and ensure that there is uh, zero uh, downtime and zero, uh, I would say, hold time, or if not zero, at least least possible hold time, you know, which essentially improves uh, the turnaround time, which is the most important and critical part in the logistics management business. Apart from this, uh, all our parks are connected centrally. So, you know, uh, managing security uh, becomes much, much easier. All parks come equipped with, uh, you know, like with security cameras. So there is a central monitoring system and even the occupiers can monitor what's really happening. The idea was to you know, reduce any kind of pilferage that may happen uh, due to the location, which are usually out of the city, certain times remote areas, et cetera. And uh, lastly, all, all the facility management related uh, aspects are completely on the app. So uh, any any kind of an issue, I mean, it may be a leaking tap to a broken uh, light or a, <coughs> or a truck which is parked uh, you know, in a no parking zone can be managed using the app and uh, a quick response time from the team, which uh, makes it easily traceable and auditable whenever required. Next. <coughs> Talking about data centers, uh, I could probably have a one hour uh, session on, on what's really happening on data centers, but I'll probably restrict it to a one single slide. Uh, the next please. So you can see, you know, uh, there is there is there are two key drivers uh, for uh, data in India. Obviously, the 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 very fact that there is there is a huge penetration of mobile uh, uh, services in the country. And the data usage generally has been going up exponentially in the country. And secondly, the regulatory aspect where the government has uh, uh, made it mandatory for data generated and originated in India to be uh, to be stored in India. Now that has essentially fueled the growth and the demand for data centers. Uh, the What you see is uh, just an idea of uh, what the data center market looks like. So we have today 8.2 million square feet, which is occupied by data, various data centers in the country. And they're growing at the rate of about 12 watt percent. And in terms of megawatt, and that's what the data center industry talks about, uh, you know, we are looking at a 338 megawatt of capacity uh, for data centers, which is approximately doubling it uh, from what it currently is. The key cities uh, today uh, are, you know, Mumbai, Chennai, these are the two key cities because that's where the, the undersea cable landing uh, points are in the country. And apart from that, there are consum consumption driven centers like uh, Kolkata, Hyderabad, Chennai, uh, Pune, Delhi, Bangalore, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, ESR intends to have a presence in four major cities, including Mumbai, Chennai, uh, possibly Hyderabad and uh, NCR. And we look, we are looking at about 4 million square feet of development. And in terms of megawatt, uh, we would be contributing to about 250 megawatt of uh, power, or rather 250 megawatt of uh, data center in the country, which would be one of the most significant ones uh, coming up in the next uh, maybe three to five years time. Next. Uh, a quick uh, idea on what we've been doing with GIC. So, so this is an 8020 partnership with GIC and uh, the intent is to develop uh, sustainable uh, logistics and industrial infrastructure in the country. Uh, we intend to invest about 750 million, uh, which would double up uh, with uh, the debt component coming in. And uh, we see this as a great partnership, uh, you know, and uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg, more to come. And, uh, I think that's, that's about it. That was my last slide. Uh, I thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Mehta, for giving us a better understanding on the outlook of data centers as well as the GV that um, the ESR has with GIC. We will now have a 15-minute Q&A session with our speakers. And for this session, it will be moderated by Mr. Veshak Kapadia. Over to you, Mr. Kapadia. Thank you. 
Uh, from a public sector perspective, we had a few questions. Uh, the first question is from Mr. Kao Huang Tiang. Uh, uh, so Mr. Tiang, uh, in the arena of green financing, India issued approximately USD 3 billion in green bonds in 2019, making it the second largest emerging market for green bond issuance. In your opinion, where do you think India can work with Singapore in the area of green financing? Hi, thanks, thanks. So I think in 2019, uh, India registered the second largest volume of green bond issuance among emerging markets. I think that's followed by Chile, Poland, as well as the Philippines. Uh, in this region, the Philippines is the large, next largest issuer, ranking fifth among the emerging countries with an issuance approximately half the size of India's. So I think in all respect, India has done a tremendous job uh, in being a leading issuer in the region. Of the issuance, renewable energy dominated the use of these proceeds. And I think India has established companies such as Adani, Grand Green Co, uh, which have used the proceeds for renewable energy projects. As mentioned earlier, sustainable infrastructure also cuts across various sectors uh, and the way forward we create new cases and new case studies of each issuance for other asset class, such as maybe green building, waste, water, and transport infrastructure. <clears throat> On the area, I think there can be a lot of cross learnings between India as well as Singapore. The Singapore's government uh, moved to issue green bonds for 19 billion worth of infrastructure projects, position the country well as a trusted hub for green finance. I think of the $8.1 billion of ASEAN green bond issuance from 2016 to 2019, uh, more than half was actually contributed by Singapore. <clears throat> but of course, challenges for green bond issuance are often project specific and largely about finding suitable projects which are well structured. Uh, this is an area that Infrastructure Asia can actually play a part in. That's working with project owners at the very early stage of projects to ensure that projects bankability and attractiveness to private sector players. Such collaboration, I think, is key to catalyze more sustainable infrastructure projects and allow more green finance to deploy, not only but in Singapore and India, but I think also regionally. Thanks. Okay, thank you. That was quite insightful. Uh, so my next question uh, is uh, to Samir. Uh, Samir, uh, how will the Indian governments push for the private-public partnership project funding models boost the sustainable infrastructure scene across India? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, thanks. Uh, maybe I'll start with an example. Uh, government of India is spending about dollar fifty billion to provide safe and adequate drinking water through Jaljivan mission. And this is what is going to put the individual household tap connections by 2024 in all households in rural India. Uh, so this itself, I would believe, has contributed tremendously towards the sustainability. If you take a uh, UN SDG 17 goals, then about six to seven goals are very strongly impacted by this. Uh, you know, and, and it would impact indirectly other goals like end of the day, if the water is coming, then a girl child is able to go to the school, you know, so so it impacts the other spaces as well. But the government also realizes that institutional and uh, social response uh, sustainability of this goal depends upon the operating and maintenance of this entire infrastructure. Otherwise, you can just do the capex and uh, you know forget about it. It has happened in the past, and the infrastructure doesn't work. But but they are well aware of that. So they have identified continuous uh, a need for the continuous monitoring uh, you know of the quality quantity and periodicity of this entire water supply in the rural india so which in other words means that they are spending heavily on uh, iot enabling the water infrastructure so so uh, this is happening across all the facets of infrastructure development so your question was basically uh, how is it boosting uh, the sustainable infrastructure across India. And I, I believe the way it is boosting is, uh, you know, um, it, first of all, it has to boost in the right direction. That's one thing. Uh, government brings in that, uh, brings in that uh, vision because, <laughs> you know, in private sector, a lot of us are a lot of times uh, concentrating on quarter to quarter. Uh, government is thinking five year, 10 year, 20, 30 year scenario, and they bring in that vision uh, in, in this specific case, uh, they have collaborated with the private sector 
as well while devising the vision and uh, then of course they incentivize it and then the private sector ingenuity and uh, innovation kicks in to make it happen so so this is the brief answer to what you are asking thanks oh, thank you samir that really helps and it's true that both have to work together it's not merely a one man's job uh, my next question goes to anup um, I know we know that uh, multiple clearances are required at the central and state level for infrastructure projects, uh, and uh, you know uh, it can be it can be a carrier for entry for foreign firms. Uh, can we expect some sort of uh, single clearance for infrastructure projects across India anytime soon? Uh, so yes, I I agree. This has uh, been a cause for concern, uh, certainly for getting environmental and land acquisition and other clearances within the country has been a hurdle. But if you see the trend over the years, especially the last few years, uh, our uh, ease of do doing business index as a country has improved considerably. The government is cognizant of the problems that are faced. Uh, by when we take up these infrastructure projects. And uh, there is a conscious effort that is uh, being made by the government to uh, improve in this area. There's also an effort to uh, bring about a technology interface for all these kind of uh, approvals which require, they're trying to make it a single window clearance. And it is expected that sometime, probably even during the course of this year, there have been announcements by the government uh, of India that uh, they will be trying to bring about uh, certain interventions which will help improve and ease some of the problems that are faced uh, while uh, undertaking such kind of projects. So those are my comments on this. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, in fact, I must add here that the government is constantly trying to improve the ease of doing business and uh, in fact, even keeping us professionals on our toes. You know, it always helps improve uh, the, and the investments into the country as well. Uh, so my next question uh, goes to uh, Prakrut. Uh, Prakrut, we know that COVID-19 has pushed many Indians online, resulting in an explosion in data created. Coupled with data localization tools and India's smart cities mission, data centers are in greater demand in India than ever before. Where do you think the data center opportunities lie in tier one cities? And will we see data center development spilling out from tier one cities into tier two cities? Good, good question, uh, I must say. Vaishak, okay, let me try and answer it in two steps. Uh, what is it that data centers require? I mean, the two most critical component that data centers require is connectivity and power. So uh, the first part, which is connectivity comes uh, primarily from the undersea cable landing point, which currently exists in two major cities, which is uh, Chennai and Mumbai. Uh, so it is it is no brainer to say the, the key centers or key attraction for data centers are primarily going to be uh, Mumbai followed by Chennai. There are other places with, where uh, the undersea cable landing points are coming up, but they are not as significant. So to answer your question, where am I going to see growth? Uh, it's going to be Mumbai and Chennai. And incidentally, these are two places where power availability also exists. And the government has been uh, you know, quite uh, pro data center developments in these cities. So uh, there is a data center policy coming up for both uh, Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra, and uh, you know, which is very, very pro data center development. So these are the two major centers. However, if you look at the data center business in general, or the way data centers work, there is a category called the edge data center. Edge data center is more like a, a satellite data center of a smaller uh, magnitude, which is used uh, for connectivity or what you call as the last mile connectivity. So instead of uh, when you're doing a Google search, instead of your search coming and you are in North, somewhere in North of India, instead of your search coming to a server, which is located in either Chennai or Bombay, you know, it's easier if, if the data is pulled out of some place in Karnal or uh, somewhere in Noida. So, which is what the basic concept of an edge data center is put, put up in a layman's term. So I do see uh, some amount of growth in tier two uh, cities, uh, but it is it is going to not be as exponential as the growth in the primary data center market is going to be. Uh, if that answers your question. 
Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we all know what to look forward to then maybe Mumbai and Chennai it should be. Uh, uh, okay, uh, my next question goes to Vinamra. Uh, so uh, Vinamra, during the first wave of COVID in India, uh, how did your clients deal with uh, the situation? And uh, what are some of the key learning points you've taken away from that situation? And uh, now that the second wave is in full swing, how is the capital land preparing itself to help sustain business operations and ensure business continuity of all, of all its clients? Thanks, Vaishak. Uh, yeah, a lot of learnings uh, that we had over the past year are now again being put into use as the second wave is progressing. I, I would say there were three things. Uh, the first was uh, a very clear uh, top priority of ensuring health and safety on the ground. Uh, our, we operate very large parks. I mean, the largest of our parks has more than 55,000 people uh, in that park, right? So very quickly, putting in the right uh, technologies, putting in the right SOPs, uh, the right practices in place uh, with a single priority that health and safety is topmost uh, for not only our customers, but for our vendors, suppliers, partners, visitors, everybody who is a touch point in the park. And, and, and we used a lot of learnings from our experience in China and Singapore, which had gone through this much before uh, India was, especially in China. Uh, and I remember it, during those early days of January when uh, you know, we you didn't even have proper thermal scanners in the market, we were importing airport grade thermal scanners from Singapore, uh, from our presence in Singapore to be deployed in all our parts, right? So the first was very clear health and safety topmost. The second was uh, our ability to be very agile and proactive and flexible uh, and partnering with the environment to be able to you know, um, act on the ground. So for example, we partnered with local municipalities to conduct a lot of testing camps so within the parks. Uh, and we were very proactive, similarly in working with all the supply chain partners as well to make sure that the basic amenities still remain in the park because customers, even though we're locked down, uh, IT, ITS was always essential services. So you had their employees still coming into the park to maintain their network infrastructure servers and so on and so forth. Uh, so we couldn't afford to just shut down the park uh, uh, even though there was a lockdown. So, so our ability to be agile and think one step ahead was very helpful. And the last point, and I think that was the most important point and which is continuing even as of today, is our very strong and open communication and collaboration with our customers. And we did it at various levels because there was so much information uh, overflow. Uh, we were really sort of a conduit to receive it uh, and, and package it and, and have a very open and regular dialogue with the customers on all matters pertaining to operations, policy, strategy, et cetera. Uh, for example, we used to have CEO roundtables where we would just have you know, the CEOs of all our customers catch up every two weeks to take stock of where everybody is, what needs to be done. Uh, and then at the employee level, a lot of our community vibrancy initiatives, which was a hallmark of how we run our parks, went online. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that, uh, that the people and the parkites uh, are still engaged with their peers, uh, uh, even though they are all at home. So, uh, and, and that spelled, spilled out to even us understanding our customers' businesses much more in terms of their impact uh, due to COVID and thereby helping the dialogue. So it was really a, a very partnership driven approach because uh, you know COVID hit everybody equally. So for us to be able to come out and be partners for our customers, I think was very well appreciated. And then when you look at all aspects from that point of view, then the journey was very smooth. And we are continuing with that uh, even today and that has been well appreciated by the customers. Okay, whenever I really think uh, it's fantastic, it must have required a lot of proactiveness and a lot of out of the box thinking on, on the part of you guys. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, so my next question, my last question actually goes to Andrew. Uh, Andrew, with the creation of uh, the new government backed development financial institution, uh, that's the DFI, uh, which will be getting a direct access to funding facilities uh, by the Reserve Bank of India. How will this impact the infrastructure projects in India and how is SNEC positioning itself moving forward? Thanks for that. I think, um, you know, predominantly uh, 
DFIs are looking to provide funds for uh, low, low capital projects. Um, and I think, uh, or, or uh, in circumstances where borrowers are unable to get it from typical commercial lenders. So I think uh, from that perspective, it, it provides a unique opportunity to finance uh, maybe projects that were not uh, initially deemed to be um, of great interest to the private sector. So I think that that is uh, maybe the first point. Second point in terms of the, the, the key uh, aspect for infrastructure is the primary objective of DFI uh, is uh, linked to economic development in India. And I think everybody uh, acknowledges and, and um, understands that infrastructure really is, is, a, is a catalyst when it comes to economic development in any country. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic initiative. I think uh, what will be interesting to see over the, the coming, uh, coming periods or quarters will be uh, the transitional uh, focus or sector-based focus. Uh, at the moment, DFI has predominantly been focused in, in railway and, and power sectors. Um, and let's see how it transitions across, across into other sectors. For us uh, as a business, um, SMEC or, or Sabana Jaron Group, um, we work with funders, whether that be uh, local funders or uh, international funders in India, um, and, and are very keen to partner and collaborate and support infrastructure development. So uh, yeah, we, we're ready uh, to, to partner with, with anybody um, and, and provide sustainable infrastructure solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. We, we do hope that uh, the DFI does its bit and brings through all promises that, that we are looking forward to. So over to Manorama. Thank you, Mr. Kapadia, as well as all our esteemed speakers who have taken the time to share with us about the opportunities that are available in the sustainable space. So now we have actually come to the end of the webinar. And I, as I've mentioned right at the start, I hope and I'm certain that um, all our participants have learned and gained new insights about this space. So for all our Singapore companies uh, that may be interested and would like to explore India, you can actually speak to one of our offices to have a further discussion on this. And you can see their email addresses in the upcoming uh, slide that's going to be with all the email addresses. Yes, there you go. So you can contact any one of us to discuss further. With that, thank you very much, everyone who has attended, and have a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.